Shalom. Today, the 10th of March of the year 2024, corresponding to the last day of the month of Adar 1, the 30th of Adar Rishon, Adar Aleph, of this year of redemption 5784, and this being Shana Mu'beret, a Torah leap year. We are standing on the eve of the coming month of Adar Sheni, the second month of Adar of this year. And this is a most uh, important and uh, significant occurrence when there is a year of 13 months, a very deep mystery. The number 13 is held by uh, some superstitious Gentiles to be a very suspicious number. They are fearful of the 13th element, the uh, 13th day of the month. And indeed for Israel, the 13th day of the month of Adar in the year of the Purim miracle was a day of complete uh, eternal significance the day when all of the tables were turned against the enemies of Israel in this month of Adar. And the Hebrew word Adir is the root of the name of the month of Adar. The Hebrew word Adir, which is used of God Almighty, the awesomely mighty, this is the root of the name of the month of Adar and it was in this month and on the 13th day of the month that the famous lots cast by Haman, the wicked Haman, as to when he would perpetrate his evil plan. It was in this month on the 13th of Adar that the date came out according to his uh, astrological and uh, uh, um, um, uh, method of sorcery for the calculation. <clears throat> and it's very significant to know why the Purim attack was scheduled for the month of Adar, because it was this month in which the Redeemer of Israel Moshe Rabbeinu was born on the 7th of Adar and it was in this month of Adar that at the end of the ministry of Moshe Rabbeinu after 40 years in the wilderness it was on this day the completion of the 120 years of the life of Moshe that Moses was called to ascend to heaven and the evil Haman knew that the whole destiny of the people of Israel is entirely bound up with the presence of the tzaddik in our midst. And not necessarily the physical presence of the tzaddik, but the awareness of the teaching of the tzaddik. As I've been discussing in recent classes about the status of the tzaddik Yesod Olam, on the level of Moshe and those outstanding tzaddik Yesod Olam, the foundational tzaddikim that followed him, these are vital to our survival. This was proven in the month of Adar through the merit of Mordechai and Esther. But Haman, who stems from the side of death, thought that the last month of the year will be the best time to work for, God forbid, the end of the children of Israel. Haman, Amalek, they're all about the end. We in this month, particularly now this year, have two months to dwell on this, and now particularly we enter into higher gear in just two weeks from today. The uh, people across the world will be preparing to uh, read the Megillat Esther and already people are talking about the uh, 
miracles of Purim, the laws of Purim. And now it's very significant that in this particular year, right now, we are indeed occupied with the Megillat Esther because we are standing at a time that is no less existentially dire for the people of Israel than right now. We was, uh, uh, just as in the Purim miracle, there was a danger to the entire Jewish people because Haman <coughs> and indeed uh, uh, the Persians, Ahasuerus, and all those people believed that since 70 years had passed, <coughs> since the rise of Babylon to power and the building of the second temple had been stalled, they believed that there was no hope for Israel ever to actually restore the temple. And that was why Haman attacked with Ahasuerus. They thought that because Moses had ascended to heaven in this month of Adar, that therefore Moses must have died. And if he died physically, they were hoping and trying to work that he would, uh, God forbid, his influence would die spiritually. Amalek is all about trying to erase the knowledge of God from the world and therefore to erase the tzaddik from the world, just like Haman felt compelled to destroy Mordechai because Mordechai would simply not flatter and pamper the insatiable pride of Haman. It is said that Haman made himself into a god. He had an idolatrous image on his, uh, his coat and everybody had to bow to this image, which was in effect bowing to Haman. Haman is the architect, ar archetype of the ultimate uh, arrogance, which indeed comes before the fall, and is the complete antithesis to the supreme humility of Moshe Rabbeinu. And so Haman had no awareness that the spirit of Moshe and the power of Moshe could still be alive in the form of Mordechai. And therefore Haman was plotting the downfall of, of Mordechai and all of Israel because Haman perceived that Mordechai as the leader of Israel was setting the example for all of Israel not to bow to his idolatry. Well now our sages have said that according to the verse in the Megillah that these uh, writings, this Megillah will not pass away from Israel ever. They said that even if all of the books of the prophets and the holy writings will become in a certain sense outmoded because we will no longer be subject to the either to the idolatry that caused the exiles of Israel or to the exiles of the nations after the final redemption. Nevertheless, the Megillah will remain as an integral part of the scriptures and the miracle will re be recounted constantly. And this is precisely this saying of our sages that the, miracle, the Megillah will always be a work of significance. This uh, saying points to the relevance of the Megillah today. We are hearing reports that the attack into Israel by Hamas terrorists on the 7th of October was actually originally planned to be coordinated with a simultaneous attack on Israel coming from the north, namely coming from Lebanon where firmly ensconced are uh, the forces of the so-called Hezbollah. And uh, the intent was to shock and stun Israel with a simultaneous attack, knowing that the Hezbollah actually armed with a far more formidable armory than uh, uh, the Hamas. And a simultaneous attack uh, with the... Uh, uh, missiles directed at strategic Israeli sites, airports, uh, power plants, and other important installations could have really uh, completely paralyzed 
the country and led to the most enormous ills. And this was frustrated. Apparently, the plans fell through at the last minute, and although the Hamas infiltrated and attacked from the south, nevertheless, they were not backed up by a simultaneous attack by the Hezbollah from the north. And this indeed was nothing less than a, a miracle, because without doubt, had that plan materialized, Israel would have been in far more dire straits than now. And it was precisely this kind of coordinated attack which Haman planned. His plan was to send letters to all of the scattered provinces of the Persian Empire of Ahasuerus, telling all of the uh, haters of the Jews across the empire to prepare for one particular day which was to be marked as a massive, God forbid, pogrom. And uh, had that come about that indeed would have been a disaster for the children of Israel, for the all of the Jews in exile in Shushan in Persia and for the Jews that had by then already returned to the Holy Land while they were waiting for the rebuilding of the temple. They'd already actually, prior to the Purim miracle, when Babylon fell to the Persians to Darius, the king of Medea, and uh, uh, his son-in-law, uh, Cyrus. They, uh, I, sorry, I've got that wrong. It was Cyrus, uh, king of, uh, 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 yes, Darius of Medea and Cyrus, the Persian, they conquered Babylon. This was 70 years from the rise to power of Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah had prophesied that Babylon would have power for 70 years. But what the sages of Israel did not take into account was that the 70-year period for the rebuilding of the temple was to be calculated not from when Babylon rose to power and overcame Assyria, overcame Ashur and Nineveh, but when Nebuchadnezzar actually destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem. So 52 years after the destruction of the temple, already as recounted in the book of Ezra, Zerubbabel, who was the leader of the tribe of Judah and effectively the king in all but name of Judea, Zerubbabel, together with the high priest Yehoshua, who is the subject of the prophecy of the candelabrum in the prophet of Zechariah, They came to the land of Israel from Babylon already prior to Ezra, and they already laid the foundations of the second temple with the authorization of Cyrus. But the building was stalled. Operating in the land of Israel at that time, among others, were the sons of no less than Haman. The Amalekites, of whom Haman was the then leader, were a nation that simply infiltrated other nations. We can identify Amalek by very conspicuous identification marks. They attack the weak, the frail, the vulnerable, the elderly, little children, women. They're deadly cowards who only attack the weak. Uh, They're constantly uh, lying. Their mission is to to uh, destroy the knowledge of the Torah, the knowledge of God, and anyone we see around today who is doing those things, there is a reasonable assumption that they're actually rooted in Amalek. And the tribe of Amalek, uh, uh, they had been the original attackers of Israel directly after the exodus from Egypt, and they were constantly attacking wherever they saw. There are many places in the, uh, the prophetic writings in the Book of Kings where among the nations mentioned who are attacking Israel are the Amalekites. And here in the time of the exile, 52 years after the destruction of the temple, the sons of Haman are working full time in the land of Israel to prevent Zerubbabel and Yahushua the high priest and their 
companions from proceeding with the building of the second temple. And one of the most important features of the Purim story is that what Queen Esther needed to do was to appeal to Ahasuerosh, King Ahasuerus, who had actually signed on to the stalling of the temple. She needed to appeal for her people and to get the process of redemption restarted. And if we're looking at parallels for the situation then and the situation today, we do indeed see just how dire the situation of Israel is today in the world, indeed existentially threatened. It may not appear to be exactly the same as in the times of Haman, although there are very many similarities across the uh, countries of the world on the streets of major capitals and centers in campuses, universities. People are protesting the actions of Israel in Gaza. And all of this is a thinly uh, veiled disguise for attacks on the people of Israel, the right of the people of Israel to live in the land of Israel, the right of the people of Israel to have security against what has been over the last years barrages of rockets and missiles and terrorist attacks indiscriminately directed against innocent civilians and yet Israel is being subjected to this barrage of hatred, which can only be seen as a phenomenon that is not going to go away and that is likely to get increasingly serious and to escalate in the coming period. Now this at a time when the situation in the land of Israel, where the Israeli army is engaged in a full-time, a full-scale war against the the uh, resisting uh, terrorists in Gaza, particularly in the southern areas of Gaza. Precisely at this point, we are receiving barrages of missiles into northern Israel every day. Just this morning, uh, just uh, a few kilometers from where I'm sitting right now, there was a barrage of missiles onto the uh, Israeli army base on, on Mount Meron, which is just uh, across the valley from Sfat, and uh, these are things that are happening literally every day and many, many voices in the world of intelligence uh, observers and experts are saying that a war is very likely to break out between Israel and Lebanon in the coming uh, weeks, if not the coming days. In fact, March the 15th has been put down as one of Israel's deadline for the retreat of Hezbollah from the border between Lebanon and Israel. And Hezbollah shows no sign whatever of intending to retreat of their own free will. And uh, the Israeli uh, government and army have uh, made no attempts to disguise that they do, intent, they do intend to dislodge Hezbollah by force which will without doubt elicit a very serious response. So all of this is directed ostensibly against Israel, against the so-called Zionist colonization, uh, colonizers, but everybody knows that all of this is actually an attack on Jews and therefore on Judaism and therefore on the God of Israel. Well now in this year, the year of the 13th month, the month of Adar. This, all of this lends a special significance to these events. It's not only in the Middle East. It's not only against uh, Jews and Israel. Uh, all around things are hotting up. In uh, the war between Ukraine and Russia, we now hear reliable reports that there are British, German and uh, French ground forces on the ground in Ukraine which crosses what the Russians have called a red line. The Russians have said that they are uh, intending to see storehouses of NATO and Ukrainian nuclear weapons in Ukraine as legitimate targets, which could uh, really open up uh, the most terrible consequences. At the same time, we have China threatening Taiwan we have North Korea threatening uh, South Korea. 
we have uh, conflicts in uh, the uh, in, in 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 southern asia we have conflicts in uh, south america we have most mysterious developments in united states of america as in europe with this uh, migrations of tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands of migrants with no particularly, lo particularly loyalty to the concept of the United States as it was envisaged across the world. Uh, we are seeing a very uh, extraordinary developments. And while uh, nobody is in a position to predict exactly what is going to happen, I would venture to say that things will be very different at the end of this month from the way they are at the beginning of this month. The world will have shifted considerably and things are very likely to escalate. So let us ponder for a moment this concept of the 13 months of the Torah leap year. The entire subject is explained with a beautiful elegance in the section of Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon Maimonides or Rambam's monumental code of Torah law, the Mishnah Torah, in the section called the Hilchus Kiddush HaChodesh, the laws of sanctifying the month, where he deals with all of the laws of determining when is Rosh Chodesh, the new moon, according to the testimony of witnesses who saw the new moon after its disappearance at the end of the previous month and they reported their sighting to the Beddin, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, who if they could confirm the authenticity of the testimony of the witnesses would declare the new month. Well now, Israel counts our time in terms of the months by the moon. We count our weeks and our days by the seven days of the cycle of the creation. But the Torah also tells us that the cycle of the festivals there are, we know, 12 months in the year and the uh, first of the month is the month of the Nisan. But the Torah also teaches us that the month of Nisan must coincide with what in Hebrew is called the Aviv. The Aviv, the spring, that is to say, the Hebrew word Aviv literally refers to the barley kernels, which in late March and April are well and truly ripening, ready for harvesting. And the Torah commands us on the second day of the festival of Pesach, on the night after the first day, to reap, to, to harvest the first barley crop growing in the land of Israel, and to bring the barley to the holy temple, to roast the kernels, to grind them into flour, and to bring the Omer offering of barley on the second day of Pesach in the morning. Well now, this is only possible if the barley is actually ripe. And this is only possible if the month of Nisan falls in the time of the spring. But the lunar year is shorter than the solar year by around 11 days. We know that the solar year is 365 and one quarter days. And the lunar year is 354 days. The lunar month the time that it takes the moon to make a complete circuit around Earth is 29 and a half days with just a little more. And therefore, over the course, the average time of the circuit of the moon around the Earth is around 30 days because of this uh, half day. Sometimes we have months of 30 days. And sometimes we have Hebrew lunar months of 29 days because you can't have a month of 29 and a half days. So either the month is going to be 29 days or 30. And uh, in most cases when there is a month, or many cases when there is a month of uh, 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 29 days, the following day will be the new moon of the next month. And if it's a month of uh, 
30 days, that means that the 30th day, as now, where we are on the 30th of Adar, will be the first of a two-day Rosh Chodesh. So now, it is through the insertion of an extra day, making a month either 30 as opposed to 29, and balancing this through the year, that we do maintain the 12 months of the lunar year, uh, months of either 29 days or 30 days, but we have not taken account of the differential between the lunar year of 354 days and the solar year of 365.25. And for that reason, we have to have this extra month inserted into the year, an extra lunar month, every two or three years in order to make sure that the lunar year maintain synchronicity with the solar year. They remain in sync. This is a, a secret, the secret of the Shanam Uberet, the, literally the, the pregnant year, the year that has this uh, Ubar, this embryo in it of the extra year. This is known as the uh, Sod Ha'ibur, the secret of intercalation, of uh, making a leap year, this is a secret known only to Israel and not, for example, to the uh, Bnei Yishmael who followed their prophet who instituted their month of Ramadan. And Ramadan is one lunar month, but since they do not have the secret of synchronizing the lunar year with the solar year, and every year is a constant cycle of only 12 months, that means that the lunar year uh, is always out of sync with the solar year and the month of Ramadan actually circulates through the year. Well, this year, when the enemies of Israel, some of them have been uh, threatening and promising outright violence during their month of Ramadan, this gives this month of Adar, which is also a lunar year, this second month of Adar, very great significance for all of the people across the world, Jewish people, Israelis, lovers of Israel, allies and supporters of Israel. You may think, well, uh, suppose they don't stage a completely uh, global attack. Well, uh, even if only one person gets injured or hurt because of all this, let alone, God forbid, lose their life, that would be catastrophic. And it's up to us to embrace the particular practices of the month of Adar and of this Purim with extra strength this year. Because the response of Israel to the attacks of our enemies is all of us to gather around the Tzaddik, around the Tzaddik Yesod Olam and pray to God, pray our hearts out to God for salvation. And at the times when in this coming period we shall be with great joy, we shall be singing, dancing, feasting, let us constantly be aware that the purpose of the whole service is to elevate everything to the one God in fellowship. Because the one thing that our enemies cannot bear is when we are all united together with the tzaddik in devotion to God. For that reason, Esther, Queen Esther, she said to Mordechai, when she realized there is no other recourse, she must go into Ahasuerus to plead for her people, for her soul, for her life, the life of her people. She says, go and gather all of the people of Shushan into the synagogues, fasting and praying, pouring out your hearts. Well, let's get us go deeper into the mystery of 13. As we mentioned, for many of the Gentiles, the number 13 is a very spooky and suspicious number, not at all for the Torah. Well, the Torah does recognize that there is the side of holiness and the side of unholiness, and the one is a kind of distorted mirror image of the other, and so just as there are the 13 attributes of mercy, so there are 13 levels of evil countering them. But let us focus on the holy side. 
For we have recently read the entire narrative of the sin of the golden calf, which indeed is absolutely paradigmatic of the history of Israel. How exactly it was back in the wilderness with Aaron, with the mixed multitude, the Eir of Rav, with their gold, with the calf, what they really did, what they believed, uh, this is quite beyond me personally. But this theme of this addiction to materialism, the selling of our souls to this, uh, the, 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 this, uh, this substitute, which is no substitute for the truth of God, this has been a recurrent feature through the times of the Tanakh, the Bible, uh, the children of Israel in the land of Israel with the various uh, excursions into idolatry and then subsequently the various uh, heresies, uh, the various splits in the people. And uh, indeed, uh, it's not an entire coincidence that one of the claims of the worst anti-Semites is that the Jews were entirely into money. Now this actually, for anybody who actually knows Jewish communities, Torah communities, knows that it's completely ridiculous. They know that uh, there are hundreds of thousands of young Jewish men who are, who, who are living a life of penury with their families in order to enable them to study the Torah day and night and to enable their families to observe the Torah. They're completely indifferent to making enormous amounts of money. There have been very prominent people who have lapsed from their Judaism and perhaps whom God rewarded with enormous financial uh, uh, wealth and benefits in this world in order to deprive them of their reward in the world of truth. But there have certainly been Jews and unscrupulous Jews. And the, the, the fallacy of the anti-Semites is to say that because there is one wicked Jew, it must reflect badly on the entire people. That is not the case. Nevertheless, the fact that there have been wicked Jews that have been exploitative and that have built for their own golden calf, this is something that we suffer the consequences of every day. As our sages taught, because of this sin of the golden calf, the children of Israel might have been wiped out entirely by God. It was in his mercy that he has reserved the penalties and spread them over multiple generations. That is to say, as our sages said, all of the suffering that comes upon Israel is on a certain level the consequence of the sin of the golden calf. It's very much a, 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 a it's too much here to go into in detail now, the, uh, the connection between the par, the, uh, the, 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 the golden calf, which was the, actually the, the egel, the bullock, the son of the par, uh, which is all bound up with the secret of the uh, para aduma, the red heifer, which we shall be entering into after Purim, which is the means of purification from impurity, from defilement, from the dead. This is connected with the concept of Purim, the concept of the name of Purim, which has the, uh, the letters of par, of the cow, in it. And this all goes very deep into Kabbalah, just to reference the... Uh, the, uh, the concept of the Manzpach, those five Hebrew letters of the alphabet that are doubled in the way they are written. They're written in a different way at the end of a word from the way they're written in the middle, making actually 27 letters of the, uh, the, the Hebrew alphabet. But those five, Mem, Nun, Tzadik, Pe, Chof, actually have the same gematria together as Par 280, and they are seen as the 280 uh, uh, sparks have descended and the whole concept of the 13 attributes of mercy is that after the Kabbalistic event of the breaking of the vessels that is to say after God formed the arena in which evil could flourish because prior to the breaking of the vessels, the Sfirot were revealed in a form that had the potential to bring about evil. 
which was a preparation for their ultimate revelation in a form that would be rectified, which would entirely dissolve evil and eliminate evil for all time. So the first step was the creation of the world of chaos, the world of tohu, of devastation. And this was the world of the evil forces the world where sparks of godliness had fallen into the depths of the clutches of evil, a realm that God created in order to elevate Israel through the challenge of fighting evil. And now the whole concept of Purim, the concept of the para aduma, the red heifer, and indeed of our services every, every day is all to lift up these fallen sparks out of this chaotic soup of uh, tohu, this devastation into which they fell. And Purim, the celebration of Purim and the whole of the, the, the observances of Adar, remembering the evil of Amalek and picking ourselves out of the false consciousness, all of this is bound up with the ultimate repair of evil. <clears throat> And therefore, when Moses ascended to Sinai, after he had broken the tablets, when he knew that he has to appeal to God to have mercy on Israel, to relent, it was then eventually that out of this worst fall, this worst descent, came about the highest revelation, that is to say, the revelation in the portion we read just two weeks ago, Kisiso, where Moses says to God, please show me your glory, and God reveals what is the true glory of God. His true glory is that he is forgiving. His glory is not that he's a God of vengeance. His glory is not that he licenses the killing of, uh, uh, of weak. Of, of, of elderly, of uh, little babies, with cruelty of rape. That is not what God loves. God is full of mercy. And that is what was revealed in the aftermath of the sin of the golden calf. And on the esoteric level, all of the Megillah is precisely about the revelation of the 13 attributes of mercy out of this dire threat to the children of Israel. There's a very beautiful story about Rabbi Yisak Luria, the Ari, the towering Kabbalist, who came at the age of 36 to live in this holy city of Tzfat, where I'm sitting now, in the middle of the 1500s and uh, he was this young man uh, supreme Kabbalist to a prophet mystic and people would come to him and ask him to tell look at their look into their soul their face their soul to tell them what they need to rectify at one time a man comes to the Ari and uh, he says Rabbi, please, I request that you will give me my tikkun, my repair. So the rabbi said, when well, you must confess all your sins. And the man went into a catalogue of all of his sins. And when he came to a pause, the rabbi said, uh, that's all? Yes. Are you quite sure? Nothing you want to add? No, no, that's it, that's it. Then the rabbi said, well, I'm going to show you that the zona, the loose woman with whom you had a relationship, with whom you sinned, her soul clings to you like a dog that won't leave a person alone, that is constantly clinging to the person, and you didn't confess that. And the man begins uh, trembling and sweating, and he says, Rabbi, Rabbi, it's true, it's true. Please give me a repair, give me a, a tikkun. And the Rabbi says, the only repair is the death penalty. You must die by burning. And the man said, whatever, whatever it takes just to be cleansed and repaired. So the Rabbi gives instructions to his attendant to prepare the boiling lead in the Torah execution by burning. It's not by actually... Uh, 
burning the person in a fire around them, rather the person is forcibly has their mouth opened uh, and uh, boiling lead is poured down, burning up their insides. So the attendant of the rabbi goes off and uh, a few minutes later he uh, announces that the, uh, the, the, it's all ready and the rabbi tells the man to lie down, to make his final confession, uh, to lie down and close his eyes and open his mouth as the rabbi says he's preparing to pour in the boiling lead. And as uh, the man opens his mouth and feels the uh, warm liquid, it's actually a, a honey-sweet liquid. And the whole repair was through the <clears throat> fear and the terror which the Ari, a blessed memory, was able to inspire into this person. The fear was enough to make the repair. And we are coming into times where many people will be subject to enormous fear and terror because uh, really the velvet gloves are being very rapidly taken off. We're seeing things happening around the world that uh, it's hard even to believe our eyes and ears and the reports and uh, without question uh, <laughs> what is happening is happening. As it says in Psalm 2, speaking about the coming of Melech Mashiach and the final redemption, Gilu bir Odo, rejoice, yes, rejoice, Gilu, but bir Odo, with trembling, rejoice with trembling. And indeed, the practices of Purim are very much about our unity. We all join together in the synagogue on the evening of Purim two weeks from now to listen together to Megillah. We all look for somebody who has less than we do to fulfill the mitzvah of matanot le'evyonim, matonos le'evyonim, the gifts to the poor. The whole of life is this reciprocity. Today one person is rich, the next incarnation they will be poor. One incarnation this person is poor, they will become rich and we have to make the corrections Tzedakah is very much what Purim is all about, joining this flow. God is all blessing. God is constantly sending blessing, infinite blessing into the world. Everywhere there is growth. Now we see in the spring uh, the uh, everything coming into life here in Israel after, with thanks to God, a wonderfully rainy uh, season. We have green uh, grasses and flowers sprouting everywhere. The whole creation is about giving, giving. And Haman is all about keeping, holding, and Purim educates us to give, to give to the poor, and then Mishloach Manot, the sharing of our cooked goodies of Purim with our friends and our neighbors. It's all about flowing, joining the flow, love, joining back to the unity, and until the climax, the feast of Purim. And indeed, now in these times, we are so in need, not of a unity, says, okay, uh, uh, you think directly the opposite uh, to me, and there's nothing to talk about. Uh, uh, people are talking about finding unity and actually dis uh, disseminating hatred and division, but the real unity comes out of trying to understand sympathetically where is that person really coming from? Why are they saying what they're saying? What do they really want? We need much more mutual listening and mutual understanding. And so as we advance into this very uh, significant month, let it be our prayer that uh, all of the blessings of Rosh Chodesh will be fulfilled in this month. In our additional prayer on Rosh Chodesh, on the new moon, corresponding to the additional sacrifice of the two oxen and the ram and the seven lambs in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, we have in the additional service of Rosh Chodesh a prayer for the blessings of Rosh Chodesh corresponding to the prayer that we have on Shabbat in the Amidah prayers of the Shabbat. On Rosh Chodesh we pray, Lord our God and God of our fathers, renew for us this month for good and for blessing. Now you count the number of words I'm going to say here. 
for good, for blessing, for joy, for exaltation, for salvation, for comfort, for livelihood, sustenance, a good life, peace, the forgiveness of sin, and the pardoning of transgression. So far we have 12. And when there is a leap year in the month of Adar, we add one extra request for blessing the atonement of rebellion, the atonement of sin. We need this atonement and pardon and forgiveness because we must admit that we are far from clean of sin. And the moment we start making our movement to repentance, God is filled already with his love for us and will receive us with the open arms of repentance, with a shower of love of the 13 attributes of mercy. The 13 attributes correspond also to the 13 tribes of Israel. Well, there are 12, yes, we know. The 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob, except that Joseph, through his outstanding sanctity and righteousness, was worthy that he was divided into two tribes, making a total of 13. And for that reason, during the cycle of the year, we follow through tribe after tribe. And uh, there are some who will make the 13 months of the leap year corresponding to those two tribes. of The extra month will be uh, one of the two tribes of uh, Joseph, Ephraim, or Manasseh. Uh, there are others who say that the 12 months of the year in a regular year correspond to the 12 tribes. And the 13th month is actually everyone together. Just as the four letters of the Hebrew name of God, Hashem, Yud, K, Vov, K, have 12 possible permutations. And each permutation corresponds to one of the 12 months of the year, when there's a leap year and a 13th year, the intent of the 13th month is all of the names, all of the permutations, all of the serufim together, which makes a total of 13 times 26, which is 312. And 312 itself is actually the uh, uh, the gematria. Uh, 312 signifies the names of two very important tzaddikim, Shimon Bar Yochai, Shin Bet Yud, 312 Shin Bet Yud, 312, and Israel Bal Shem, Israel the Bal Shem Tov signifying again that the real tikkun in this month of the ascent of Moshe is reconnecting with God through our devotion to the teachings of the tzaddik who attained the ultimate humility and attained the ultimate awareness and understanding of the 13 attributes of mercy. And may God shine to all of us and to all of his creation with his infinite mercy and loving kindness. And may we indeed see the ultimate redemption and the restoration of Jerusalem in our generation this year of redemption.